Hello everyone, today we talk about the medieval shield. The year before the last I started this mini-series about the essentials of medieval uh, panoply, say helmets, um, swords, armor, uh, etc. So obviously this is just a general presentation, I will be saying banal things for some. Um, also a bit more interesting, maybe for the same uh, audience. Still, in any case, the reference for something more detailed, as you know, is in the um, Arms and Armor playlist, or also the Military um, Units series, that, as you know, can dwell for, you know, hours, in fact, on the panoply of a single uh, trooper type. Um, however, this um, introduction can be useful also to highlight uh, some spiritual, symbolic, traditional aspects about uh, even the shield, right? How, how would you describe this? I know it's plenty of Hema videos out there that, you know, talk um, far, uh, far and wide about shields. I don't know how, you know, better my content is. In comparison, surely I, I talk about much more um, effigy, actual sources and, and, and variety um, of, in fact, uh, arms uh, than they do, and I say it without modesty. But surely the aspect gets down mostly to the material side of the story, as I do mostly in that arms and armor um, series. But there is always a meaning that goes beyond uh, not just warfare, as von Clausewitz teaches, is a clash between moral forces primarily, but uh, since we are not Gnostic heretics, we perfectly know that uh, not just the, uh, say, the, mor the morale is superior to, 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 to matter, but that the two are indestructibly intertwined. So if the sword that we have already seen in, in this series represents the warrior's audacity, the shield symbolizes his nobility and fortitude. Uh, I also would like to talk more about medieval and traditional symbolism and philosophy, etc. But this is what, uh, of course, the shield comes to uh, to to embody. Um, also, with changes, of course, throughout the medieval millennium that we will partly observe uh, through the the same technical uh, point of view. So, born to protect the body, over time, the shield becomes the face of the knight, as you know with, uh, with the coat of arms, right? This is essentially the surface where uh, the knight paints his uh, arms, his exploit, his aspirations. I made a video that I will post you uh, down below in the top fixed comment uh, that is well, the symbol of... Um, Norman kind, let's say, Bayeux tapestry kind shaped uh, shields designs that are often said, well, this is not heraldry yet, so it's as if, you know, it's just simple decorations. No, right? There were very precise meanings, even at that point, and the fact that those were not categorized as it would happen, not even the late Middle Ages, but as you know, heraldry is a modern science, the only truth. It started in the early Middle Ages, and yeah, you can, of course, trace the roots, but um, in exactly in this sense, it, it's not a, you know, categorically separated issue for which, you know, uh, meaning was invented later. As a matter of fact, we were much more sensitive to it before, and say heraldry is just one of the, the aspects of the, the generation from the from the primal um, origins of, of these ideas that were meant to be, in fact, most, mostly spiritual and uh, attributing very scarce importance to um, Material aspect made lots of videos about late medieval warfare, the say, say the, the 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 fate of of knights, of men at arms, um, the the entire issue of the say the, the autumn of the Middle Ages to quote Zynga or you know the, the military revolution that is all wrong by, by the way because as you know I'm also very much um, you know um, harsh I think but uh, fair. Uh, regarding the uh, underlining the continuous preeminence right of the men at arms in also in late medieval warfare and resizing the the, the, the sensationalistic sort of firework attitude of oh my god the, the infantry revolution that 
never happened, right? It took like uh, half of a millennium. Uh, and immediately after, there is actually a, a dramatic acceleration that was not called revolution, right? Never mind the armies of Louis XIV, etc. But, you know, that's unfortunately the, um, the world in which we live and that we have to cope with, you know, you know whether or not. So, as you know, I go step by step. Uh, and to quote that later, say, uh, romanticism, nostalgia for, uh, for the Middle Ages, right? Uh, there is a passage from uh, The Liberated Jerusalem by uh, the Italian author Torquatus Tassus, 1544-1595, that expresses in that um, time of confessional clashes and renewed sort of anxiety towards, you know, the, the unknown, think about the trauma of the um, effect of the Reformation, of, say, this opening to, to a world, the, the, the dazing um, uh, effect, of the, the lack of a center, etc., that was still identified in, in the lack, in, in the degeneration of moral values. And the quote goes by, better defense than Holberg and shield is holy innocence on the bare chest, which naturally uh, summarizes great part of what is, say, the, the tradition of the, 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 the pure, say, pure force, pure action, pure will, right, uh, beyond any um, fallen material dimension. Of course, there are many examples of this um, throughout, say, with various anthropological declinations. Think about David and Goliath, etc. Et uh, so the symbolic meaning of the shield is linked to the transposition of its defensive function to the spiritual level, obviously enough. Um, it's as if, in theory, you didn't need any defense because it would have been a cowardly thing, right? People have issues with, I don't know, firearms. Uh, I said before, you know, it was just cold steel. And I, well, cold steel is also a hell of a technological, um, you know, auxilium that uh, back in the day that did not even exist. So um, there is always, let's say, this material dimension is always altogether the, the measure of, of human failure and of the fall, right, that you have to hopefully transcend in an heroic way, and especially in, in holy combat, made lots of videos about the traditional Indo-European you know, belief of the holy combat up to Bernard of Clairvaux, the, the Templars, uh, etc. So th the fact that uh, the heraldic codes of arms were generally framed in, in, a, in a shield gives a very particular emphasis to the overall value of, of this tool, because it's as if it, it, it had been together with uh, with with the panoply altogether, first of all the sword, but still like of the alter ego of of, of the warrior, right? Uh, and so expressing those characteristics that were proper of that specific guy. It's, it's just like with units, right? Every unit says every warrior is different, has different colors to a degree that express different um, virtues, also different faults in a way, right? Because uh, nobody's perfect. Um, and that, um, in fact, can be employed differently uh, in, in a military sense. Um, this, uh, the symbols, as you know, were present also in, in the crest of the helms, uh, frequently at tournaments, especially in the very later times. They, you know, the, this, this arms were, the, were, were present in the stead of the same warrior at, at a point. So they had a transcendental... Um, meaning such as I don't know the, the king's two bodies um, in uh, the, 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 the sense that la, la, la bannière ne meurt jamais right the, the, the man can die but what he represents as his house as his blood etc is another matter and that also has a very ancient uh, meaning of say the, the maintenance of, of a of a genius and still of a hopefully a a deified um, so. Uh, dimension right in the in a hierarchy at least in heaven uh, that would have served for the final struggle of the end times etc uh, so the knight publicly announces his identity and his uh, his ancestors through fact such means claiming them and at the same time relying on them in the hour of danger uh, it's also obviously a very useful mean of uh, recognition. It's not the only one. The shield evokes the good fate of its owner. And 
and what it would be the, the peaceful nature of the same, right? We defend ourselves because there is somebody that essentially, you know, prevents, opposes himself to our otherwise rightful path. But as we were recalling before, so if this rightful path is obstacled, uh, this gets down to, to a fault also of who he has not been able to convince the other uh, by walking in the world and essentially dominating it. Uh, and uh, the obvious concept, uh, the, ul- the, always, the ultimate goal is coming back to the one, essentially rendering justice, um, uh, dominating the world through such overall uh, order. And sometimes in religious images, the shield is held by angels and bears the instruments of the passion, the arma Christi in Latin. Right? Also remember that the, the idea of like the, the appear martyr, meaning witness, right? And it referred to the fact that in Christianity, of course, of the appearance of Jesus, and so at that point of the fair complete in terms of um, successful transfiguration through, um, through faith uh, and works, right, and, and grace that all come together, at least in the Catholic belief that existed also before Christianity, that in fact referred to holy combat, where in the moment of greatest danger, you would see death Right, the Furies, the Irinis, the uh, the Filzia, right, that were the female uh, symbol to to possess and to transfigure and to turn into essentially the the angelic woman of the in fact of the chivalric romance that is an idealized vision, like it would be also Mary, but the uh, uh, victory, right, the winged glory, the Holy Ghost uh, herself that would bring the. Uh, the soul, the victorious, transfigured soul, um, uh, in uh, in heaven, right, to be au pair with God, right, with a place in the firmament that the hero had managed to transcend that greatest level of fear that he's basically his own, one of his own soul, um, and to transcend physical reality. Um, the cross, think about the Crusaders, the crown of thorns. The nails and other objects used for the crucifixion of Christ, um, the only true defender of faith, in fact, are often represented in in the in, on on shields. Um, uh, just think about the sword uh, itself; that would be a cross uh, at the same time. As Christians was particularly convenient. So the shield was the first defensive equipment invented by man. Uh, even before armor or any other sort of defense, it has accompanied warriors for all latitudes for millennia, and this for only one simple and rational reason, because it works. And when life is at stake, rationality is always the first guide for one's decisions. There is nothing about what materializes uh, in warfare, in, in design, in, 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 in doctrine, etc., that doesn't have a rational purpose, that is not connected to what you have there as a, as a military instrument that can be employed for the, uh, also for the worst, for that matter, and also for the for wrong political reasons, but that still has the purpose of annihilating uh, the enemy. Uh, and that, in this sense, uh, you know, has to cope with the fact that the enemy at that point would like to annihilate you um, uh, equally. And so the, the, the concrete materialization of these tools uh, is what you see throughout all military history. There is always a purpose. There is always a reason uh, in arms and armament and the way people fight uh, in a certain way. And so, especially for such um, incredibly old and persistent, like resilient um, weapons, such as the the shield itself. Uh, for the ancient Hellanes, um, as you know, the shield was so important that in many cases the typology of the troops was defined on the basis of the shield that they were equipped with, right? Uh, there is the old controversy, and people say, ah, but the term hoplite doesn't derive from hoplon, at least in the measure in which hoplon means a shield. Well, um, this doesn't matter. Like if you say Oplon, it is by a bit the way which we have transposed the concept of panoply. It means like the the entire um, equipment we can say because it's unrelatable. Also, some sort of tool, but obviously it's functional to that. And the shield 
did have a, as you know, massive importance in Hellenic warfare for lots of reasons that we can't simply digress on um, uh, today, but, you know, that, in fact, I have a pretty large Hellenic warfare playlist as well, where I explained uh, opolitic warfare, I think, at length, and we still have to say a lot, don't you know, the truth. Um, the, what we call the Alplan, say, the, at least the Hellenic sh- uh, opolitic shield was um, large, round, accentually concave uh, for heavy infantry, like in fact uh, the the political phalanx um, really was, right? And when you realize that that the Peltastai, the Turiophoroi, uh, the Aspid, that there is plenty of you know the the Greeks normally called uh, the um, their troops or the ones that hired, by the way, from other peoples that surely called them in ways that unfortunately we do not know. Um, because this lighter troop, especially Peltas, the two Realphoroids, etc. I mean, that is about those, by the way, uh, were mostly mercenary and foreign, right? But the sense was that the shield, like in, in the Atlantic mentality, was inherently um, conservative to, to the point of crystallization because of the uh, idealistic assumption that uh, the, the Atlantic world was perfect in and itself. Um, brought unavoidably in this loss of initiative that would follow from it also, uh, at least not after having proven that the Greeks surely had something from, from a military point of view as well, um, the uh, the defensive gear of the trooper. That, this that derives from the fact that uh, at least classical uh, 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 Hellenic warfare was uh, essentially the one of amateurs, right? With the usual exception of the Spartans, that also didn't go at war as intensely from an individual point of view than you know any warrior from from Central Europe or also the Balkans or our closer places um, were uh, just were not military professionals, right? And so they also overloaded themselves. It was because of the prosperity of their police with 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 armor. This this did create a problem because that type of warfare was specifically suited for the Atlantic motherland, but they had to change that, uh, of course, when they started fighting abroad uh, as well. And so, you know, lots of things happened during the Peloponnesian War, and, you know, the Ficaratian the reforms. But first of all, like, probably the, the true surpassing of political warfare with, with, with Alexander, with, with the masses, Philip II and Alexander III, uh, etc. But indeed, they did call him like that. The Romans, for example, called their troops instead with the names of weapons. Right, think about the the astati. Think about and the 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 concept there is a completely different way of war and culture. Right, uh, uh, the Romans had, for example, symmetric formations. The Greeks had them um, asymmetric, also because of the shield, because they had the shifting toward the right while it advanced, because they tended to just cover themselves over more by exposing the left flank. It was the one covered by the shield and, and engaging like in, in very say mediated fashion. Um, uh, normally, other peoples instead fought straight, directly, much more aggressively and individualistically to a degree, which was not necessarily better, but in the case where, you know, discipline met that kind of um, individual uh, impetus, like in the Roman case, you know, um, there you have, in that case, the end of uh, Hellenic independence for that man. Um, in any case, we're not talking about ancient warfare, but it's important to fix this this, this idea. Right, the Peltas were equipped like but with this small shield known as Peltas, the Tureophoroi, Tureos bearers, uh, um, and the Tureos would mean like a door in size, uh, because they uh, took it essentially from the Celtic and Italic uh, mercenaries, right, at the time around the, the 80s, the 70s, or the 3rd century, because they had been fighting against both uh, at that point and hiring them to as mercenaries. Um, this... The, these were the soldiers who went into battle with a noble shield, large but handy. The the Hellenic Hellenistic version was also slightly smaller than the uh, the Celtic-Italic one, by the way. Um, as for the sake of example, the shape of the shield, its weight, the way it was held, and other details, of course, reveal, as we were saying before, the the, the fighting style of its wielder, because this is not just one piece separated from the other. It works in synergy with, with all the rest of the equipment, and not just the armament, by the way. So it's carefully designed, and actually that that's 
a phrase I always say, you know, there aren't many ways to make a shield, right? There isn't here a, a major, you know, technological secret or, I don't know, genial understanding about what kind of shield you have to... Mostly all the military development that occurred um, were matter basic, like, you know, you would create arms and armor that would essentially fit better a slightly different type of, of uh, say, of tactics, etc. And the shield remains a shield. There are not many ways to make a shield, right? So when we look at these differences, you always have to be very aware of the fact that it's, in a sense, the least of um, important aspect of warfare, per se, right? Uh, if you are fixated with how shields were made, but, say, you do not understand really how tactics work much more extensively and in a way that person has never seen on YouTube nor much anywhere else, frankly, you know, that, that is a problem. That's a great problem we have uh, all over the world with the lack, essentially, of uh, strategic uh, education as also a military historical one. In any case, when you talk about shields, to, to get things very, very basic, we can distinguish two major categories, right? So on, on the one hand, there are the medium, small shields, often round in shape, and with a central or forearm handle, which were used above all to deflect projectiles, and occasionally in hand-to-hand -hand combat. We've seen them very frequently in our Steps Warfare videos, like the, the lighter um, horsemen uh, in that case, uh, but the skirmishers in general, also on foot, um, in other military culture, it's still those, depending on the concept of cavalry, of course, is always subject to, to dismounting right? you know, and get, becoming infantry to some degree. So um, this, this uh, lighter shield was mostly used to, to have an extra right, protection in, in a system that you would think was much more exposed, actually, to missile, because normally troops engage in some, some sort of symmetric way. All warfare is asymmetric. Uh, but in, in this case, normally troops, uh, the odds are bound, especially in the larger engagements. So the lights fight against the lights, the heavies against the levies. Um, and in, in that process, you would think that you, you would need to pose more armored troops to the lighter ones. But the problem is that if you do so, you also tire them to an extent. Uh, you want to, uh, you have to check them not to outflank you, things like that, and, you know, order. Line, alignment, etc. is all very important, especially, especially the, the uh, fresh forces. And you can't have the men at arms adjusting at every step of the way because of that. That's why they are so also heavily armored in general, but why there are other troops that cope with, with those others. Um, and their best armor is actually speed. And the, the, the volume of fire they can put up um, so that uh, the light will be more exposed even to um, to to missile, but that let's say its best protection is counter missile fire as such. Um, so going back to shields, the other group is represented by the largest and heaviest ones, so oval, rectangular, or round in shape, as you will see now. Often equipped with a boss that is present also in some smaller shields, think about bucklers, etc. Uh, the boss's metal hemisphere placed in the center of the shield, which was one with a handle, which had, um, you know, a great importance because, first of all, it was it, it represented a sort of bare center, um, and uh, it it protected with this thick metal um, uh, in fact uh, hemisphere uh, the the hand, so that if a missile, we'll see now shields, the, the wooden part was often. Uh, damage, right, so you could be transfixed uh, be even behind that, and armor was, generally speaking, more more effective at least the one of, say, metal type, um, and that's why also very often the heavier troops not necessarily had always, uh, uh, say, the heavier shields. Throughout most history, that's true, but as you know, at the end of the Middle Ages, um, uh, with all that plate armor on, the, the, the purpose of shields somehow decreased, right? It never, they never disappeared. They could always be assisting, even in hand-to-hand -hand combat, uh, etc., in combination with your weapons, etc. I will see now there were varieties. But the idea is also that you can punch with a boss. You have the, the, the fist right there, 
Um, and, and so there can be a lot of dynamism uh, with that type of, um, let's say, of, of balancing that, in fact, doesn't last uh, forever, um, even in, in hand-to-hand fighting, so that, in fact, especially with larger weapons, more armor, uh, already by the, the 13th century, you see that the, the boss is not there, in, uh, especially in nightly warfare, but they're not only, right? Because there are different forces uh, involved uh, in the battlefield, in the first place, and, and so the, the that's where technology bends to tactics, right? It's not the other way around. It's the, if that happens, it's definitely minorities, like a ten percent, right? Never think that technology makes tactics. It's the other way around. This is notorious for any historian of uh, technology or economics. And unfortunately, we do live in a world where people cannot understand this concept anymore. Right? They they focus exclusively on that, right? Thinking that I don't know if there was a fixed front between France and Germany during World War the First. It was not because of the, the, the entire political, military or social force uh, of those powers. It had to be because of machine guns and shells. Well, that's not the case, right? You need, first of all, people to fight. You need forces to sustain that. So uh, if the, the odds as they were were balanced, of course, uh, technological uh, uh, say factor can make the difference, but in the sense that it makes it like a, I don't know, 1% or 2% uh, that can help you making 50 plus 1, but people forget all the other 49%, um, 50% that instead has, is beyond, of course, what happens, or say it becomes what happens on the battlefield, but just, you know, vanity can come to disrupt uh, the, the, the matter much, uh, much more than the technology can, and yet, again, actual adults, people who vote, who can drive, who you know, who have children, actually do not understand such simple idea. Um, and that's the extent of uh, ignorance that I was referring to before. Um, so these heavier shields normally ha- were more enveloping in shape. Uh, this is yet another concept that, you know, of course... Uh, gets misunderstood. Uh, the fact that the so-called first of all, let, let's debunk and make it a bit about shield, and everybody is fixated with shield walls. Apparently, at least in pop culture, that is the sense. Oh my God, the shield wall! What a complex thing! It, it it must require so much capacity, and it's such an intelligent thing, right? It's, it shows the cockery, the manhood of all this. I don't know how to break it down to you, but every single. Um, unit who has ever used shields made shield walls, right? It's not um, a difficult, complicated thing to do, actually. Making shield walls normally uh, equates to be a weaker type of infantry, because, as we will see now, the enveloping shape is not functional to um, to that kind of, of course, of over interlocking of the shields by overlapping them. Um, and it's proper of those troops that have more individual capacity, in the sense, it can be still framed within a disciplined host, right? Think about the Roman legion, think about how curved the scutum really was. Uh, because even if they were fiercely um, and brutally uh, disciplined, they also had that uh, still warrior heathers uh, that saw the individual as a sort of um, noble uh, prodige in arms, right? Blessed by, by God and with the task of taking over the world. And when you look at, say, the most typically you know, the, what normally exalts uh, uh, more typically the, 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 the crowds is the, the early, uh, you know, the migration era, the somehow early medieval or Viking era type of warfare where, you know, those masses of men very often didn't have much of a, of a discipline compared to, you know, to, to other times and in which, in fact, the, the toughest troops normally were used not to maintain that shield walled in, 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 a, in an absolute sense, but often to smash into it, right, to break through um, essentially this, this uh, levy infantry that obviously would, to protect themselves in the front, interlock the shields, but also with that you can't even simply uh, fight, especially when you have to smash into the other shield, and so also this, the, the, another thing that has um, obsessed a bit after the Vietnam War, some uh, scholars, especially the ones of the new military history that is, was one of the greatest tragedies in the history of mankind culturally, was the sense of, okay, but being paranoid about losses, 
right? And so the fact that even the aforementioned of political warfare or these other ones were about poking each other behind the shields and remain timidly behind them. These were people who could just not, and this is what it, every idiot does, right? One of the few good things that I think, you know, reenactment shows uh, accurately is that every imbecile with no preparation, no capacity, no strong nerves whatsoever can throw himself in a heated fashion against the enemy. Except the best people, those who would use more, you know, um, enveloping shields, exactly because they had to cover themselves more, ex exposing themselves more individually out there, uh, were the ones who would essentially, you know, eliminate the physical consistencies of these individuals that, of course, cannot maintain any cold blood and uh, rationale. And, and, and that was all what, even before, we were saying in holy combat, tradition dictated. Right, and the difference was being between a man and a lesser people, right? Um, so the one over which you would lord because they were inferior morally, culturally, and personally, and so would in fact use preferentially that kind of tactics. This is not to say that shield walls were not used also by some of the toughest troops out there, but, but uh, you know that was not a distinctive, you know, uh, fashion of it. Right, they could be tougher in a way, but uh, Normally, those kind of troops are used best in, in attack, as any strategic concept really brings you. And in attack, you know, you want to smash into the enemy, not just much protecting yourself uh, or maintaining that interlocking order just for the sake of it, um, unless you are, you know, uh, trying to, I don't know, to come extremely um, close to, to the enemy, like under a, a hell of fire. Yeah, that is the case, but... That's also why pop culture made this stuff mostly about defense, so not understanding the strategic concept behind that. But after that, opening the damn formation, at least, you know, the, the shields, launching yourself to the assault and chopping to pieces human being in a bath of blood, which is the only concept for which the military is designed in the first place. And of course, yes, you have to maintain a, a, an adequate level of cohesion, being able to come back, because these engagements were very, very short, as you know. They didn't last more than a few minutes, and then you had to revert information right and being able to withdraw in in good order at the same time and things get always messier on the battlefield than what you're trained for but uh, at that point in fact that's not the the shield alignment that probably you're going to to consider just as a life um saving you know um condition just per se um and it's all part again of a much more um comprehensive uh system just per se so yes, the as, as it's obvious, like we were talking about Roman legionnaires, we we're talking about like about medieval knights, etc. What do you think the enveloping shape was functional to? The fact that they were more individually exposed, right? Not necessarily the Romans, because again we have this fixation that um, everything had to be completely thick, locked, and compact. We do not actually have reliable info about what's the distance between. I don't know. Even I talk in the Romans, but it could be. You, you remember the shields before, um, the door shields before, also about Celtic warriors and so on. So the, again, the, the the order is not about necessarily the it's not about the distance between the soldiers. Say the effectiveness of the order doesn't necessarily have to do with the distance, the the centimeters be, between the soldiers. It it it's flexible. It's something that changes during the battle as well, right? It, it, the most important thing is the collective order and training. That does start from these things, but it has to do with properly that a unit scale level of, of awareness, right? Um, uh, when knights get overloaded in, say, in individual training, that still corresponds. In fact, the two things can coexist to a to a traumatically uh, collective one. Still, it's obvious that if you're more exposed and horseback, especially um, more than infantry, you can use that kind of uh, uh, you know, close order to defense. Well, you um, uh, you do need something more enveloping, something more uh, anatomic. If you want, all shields are anatomic, of course. You know, that if you if you create a shield like this, mostly conceived for that with that flat kind of until locking capacity, you will defend mostly what arrives from the front, and that's what I was saying before. That it, it automatically excludes most of the other threats. Right, so that uh, it, it tells you that the the type of warfare entailed there is less uh, refined, right, less complex, 
right? It's made based mostly, you, you know, in Germanic warfare that where you mostly would see this stuff. Uh, very intense charges, right? And then not much more than that, right? So those shields were, in a sense, perfect. They were balanced, as you will see now, also in weight, and they, they calculated all that incredibly complicated uh, distribution of re, uh, of energies that um, even the you know the, the humblest of fighters at that point would have been much more aware than we are today, um, and in a real context, right? That's what I. That's always my my thing against reenactment, or you know, that does not show how it really was, right? Because the context is not there, right? You can't even stay. You can't kill yourself with an equipment on for days on end under the sun, under weather, whatever. But that's not really telling you how they did it in the past and what would have been considered, you know, uh, even foolish to do, maybe in those circumstances, because you are not in a medieval army. You're not there to kill other people, right? It's just a big joke, right? Uh, great pictures I use from reenactment, also in my videos, with all proper crediting, etc. But it's not the thing. You want to attract people... Um, towards uh, history, etc. Great, but don't pretend this to be anything more than that. Even when things get closer to the deal, there's no doubt about that either. But it's not necessarily going to be even, you know, remotely close to be historically relevant for what we do in academies, right? And that is, yes, it it, it is much more concrete than what is done uh, even outdoors. Um, in any case, um, as we understand, these heavier shields were typical of melee troops, right? Uh, they had they, they protected from shots from a distance, but also had to be manageable enough to be wielded effectively uh, in hand to hand combat, where you fight with both things, right? If you want to break somebody's uh, teeth with you know the edge of a shield or with the umbo, we were saying before, well, the boss, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's you know how dynamic it gets. We're, we were telling it before also for the lighter troops with the little uh, round shield. Well, that also does. Everything does. You can com fight with uh, with multiple weapons at a time. Slung over the shoulder, your back. We will see it. Um, and there are lots of things you can do with a shield. Not just with anything that you bring on the battlefield. You can use it also in the most unorthodox ways. Right. Um, this is true for lances, etc. There's not a standard way of using something. There is a preferential suited design kind of way to do certain things, but it's still an object. You can do a lot of stuff with that, including throwing it, right? Or even getting rid of it at some point, um, uh, etc. Now, the strength of the shield was proportional to its weight, uh, but in battle, an equally important requirement was handling, as we've said, the chroniacles that are actually the breadth of medieval warfare, even though. Uh, there is in half of Western um, historiography a sort of paranoia uh, towards their reliability that is, instead is normally very high. Um, the uh, referred to shields broken by a well-aimed blow of a spear, axe, or sword, and yeah, it, it, it's it, it's a physical thing. It would happen also probably with um, some frequency, but it's obvious that uh, still the way they were designed had a specific functionality. I met people said, well, you know, they would go on fighting at some point, but it would remain without shield. Well, it, it's not really, if that happened, it's because lots of other things had gone wrong, right? You know, not just shields. Um, and in any case, um, that's not exactly even how, you know, you would expect to, say, during a battle to, to win an engagement, waiting to break somebody else's shield, by the way. Matter of priority, hierarchy, again, that that also is zero as far as I uh, look around. Uh, now, at, at the dawn of the Middle Ages, the shield was, of course, the most widespread defensive weaponry. Uh, it had been for quite a while, also because it was the cheapest. Um, and, and so, again, always reflect on this because uh, they could have invented other means. They could have also... Uh, there was always a compromise between, especially armor, that was the most important stuff. Um, and that in the price can make you understand also the proportions of this. A, a shield cost a third of a helmet and a sixth of an iron mail coat. That normally cost a freaking lot, right? Um, so much so that these last elements were the prerogative of the sole leaders, right um 
the the so this gives you an idea of also how uh, enduring how reliable this weapon could weaponry really could be um all frankish warriors for example in addition to being armed at least with a spear had to possess a shield this is really typical like in all kind of romano-germanic recruitment uh, requirements the shield was round, made up of overlapping layers of wood, and shaped in such a way as to give it a concave shape that contained a blow, recalling uh, the aforementioned Lenick uh, design. Uh, this is, you know, it's a universal function, right, design. It's uh, the characteristic. It's not, you know, about drawing, again, a connection between the Franks or the Greeks here. It's, it's right, really saying that as we were saying before, there are not many ways to make a shield, right? And the, the concave shape has obviously a this the it's a containing function, right? Plus, on the external, so uh, a deflecting one, uh, etc. Uh, we can't even just descend on some other minutiae weapons can de- get stuck everywhere, um, etc. Including inside of people and it can be very dangerous uh, in any case um, some shields were covered with leather perhaps on both sides uh, by the way and the edge around the conference could be reinforced by a folded metal strip sometimes a metal structure fixed at the back gave it a greater solidity too uh, showing that again even the shield could follow this various uh, of course enhancement uh, you know, corresponding to, to wealth, to the, the same type of combat that entailed, because if you are that aforementioned more aggressive, uh, say, combative, uh, assaulting type, and you need also extra protection, you don't need it just for, for armor, you want also the rest, right, to still be, uh, to deteriorate less easily um, under the blows, Right to still make you functional and uh, not having a busted wing. As we said, the main feature for the purpose of combat was the presence of the boss, to which the handle with which the shield was held was connected at the back. But this is um, this not only effectively protected the soldier's hand, but also allowed the shield to be wielded with greater ease. Right with that again, um, better distribution of of, of balance. Um, in essentially together with your hand, right? Um, a uh, a second type of grip consisted of two leather straps, one to slip the uh, forearm through and one to hold the shield tightly in the hand. During the marches, the shield was held on the back or placed on the shoulder with an additional leather strap which could also be useful in combat in situations where it was better to have the hands free right and this did happen uh, frequently all you had to wield I don't know double handed weapon uh, you would uh, again we said before you sling your um, shield over the shoulder and or there were types of shields again like the lighter ones you could use that say uh, atta- uh, say uh, attached to the forearm uh, or slung on, on the back, etc. The Carolingian shield, um, given the the increase in importance of the individual warriors, so not much for the uh, just the average Frankish levy, but for also the what were becoming the, effectively the milites, right on on horseback, the heavily armored men at arms. Um, the um, it, w- it was an average larger than other early medieval shields uh, with a diameter between 50 and 80 centimeters. It protected a larger portion of the warrior's body from the neck to the lower abdomen. Uh, there are lots of reasons here. Generally speaking, the uh, greater the defenses, uh, the, the greater the offenses, right? Uh, it's a bit like, you know, the, the egg and, and the chick move which one was born, chicken was born before. Um, they they went in parallel, right? There is not a cause-effect um, consequence that cannot be reversed as far as defensive and offensive gear is concerned, right? So it, it's uh, there is from one side a just an obvious concept that is to say the, the heavier, say the, the better defender you can get, and often heavier, like... Um, 
generally the more you belong to an elite in a in a m more powerful military machine that is such for the all the elements that make it up right um, so in this current engine times you you definitely see that um, equipment happening the front surface of the shield was often decorated at this point with geometric or conceptual motives uh, that had the the aforementioned meaning like this was a um, depending on which people were talking about was different art right different styles re representations but the core concepts about universal glory uh, imperial tradition um, divine transfiguration were all there right um, this was really an ancient habit I mean the one of painting the shield surface um, Say, for example, also the Iliad describes similar decorations both for the Greeks and for the Trojans, uh, obviously. Um, so we pass to the High Middle Ages and towards the 10th century, uh, a new type of shield appears. Um, derived, by the way, directly from the round one. It is defined as drop, um, almond, kite uh, shaped. Uh, and uh, it, it's a bit one of the most iconic, at least uh, probably the, the, the high middle ages, of, um, at least the, the the primitive era of chivalry, uh, the Crusades, etc. And its spread was very uh, very extensive, right? Uh, we have some of the first evidence, uh, essentially contemporary, like in like in essence, like the 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 info is. For these years, naturally difficult to 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 get uh, from because the sources are scarce in general. We see them in the Byzantine Empire, in Ottonian Germany, um, but it, it is mostly associated with the Normans on the Bayeux tapestry. You can see that also the Anglo-Danish uh, use it. So it was really um, ubiquitous, we can say, uh, and this starts being the norm in European warfare, right? From the high, late Middle Ages, you you really see a, a uniformity uh, in uh, in the continent, right? At least in the most, at least in this broader post carolingian world that conquers uh, other places to the Crusades, the, the Reconquista, um, the Anglo-Saxons, uh, Arab Sicily, etc. And so that spreads from the heart of the West um, pretty much like to, to define uh, a certain feudal military culture, right? Um, the, the shape has not only to do with mounted warfare and so the necessity compared to the, um, to the round shield to cover also more the leg because we see uh, the same knights but also humbler infantrymen using this drop shaped shield so this depends as we were saying before on factors to delude from the mere mechanism i mean the, the 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 more you could protect in that case your legs well in a sense the better but what does this mean right more uh resources availability and in fact the say the, the economy of the continent is, is rising notoriously um more missile fire so more insidious um uh projectiles right hitting you also Know, below uh, your waist, etc. Um, in the case of a of a horseman, naturally you want to appreciate the force of infantry that is becoming stronger, and so that can hurt you, like in the melee, more easily. Also at the um, at the leg, right? There's not a scientific, precise way to preserve your leg, right? In such circumstances, that as we were pointing out, could be very chaotic. But this still is the compromise of what they could afford. Uh, in terms cost benefit ratio and considering still that the thing that mattered the most here were was tactics in a in a collective fashion so um, a Norman cavalryman was much more concerned about maintaining cohesion and smashing into the enemy lines with proper cavalry charge in a section that seemed to be um, uh, about to break um, uh, the most through a, a softening process of, of the enemy ranks that uh, entails still throwing javelins from horseback even for the heavier knights and also uh, as you know you know with with, with infantry other any everyone you had and everything you had um 
So we observe in these changes just some tendencies that basically tell us that things were changing into a specific direction. And of course, everything was always changing. Uh, we see uh, in our Arms and Armor series that there are some you know, uh, arms and armor style that you can properly pinpoint a certain decade of, of the 12th, of the 13th century. Um, and what you realize is that all over Europe, more or less, even though equipment was not standardized in, in, a, in an absolute term, of course, nor it would have been feasible to do at the time, nor today, technically it is, not even in, after, I don't know how many industrial revolutions. Um, but um, that essentially, right, these designs... Uh, become homogeneous, right? Um, especially from the 13th to the 14th century, we cannot quite distinguish a man at arms from any part of Europe, perhaps the, the very east uh, or the Balkans, but overall, right, the man at arms and also the humbler uh, fighter are equipped in essentially the same ways. Um, but going back to Norman times, as you know, uh, cavalry establishes itself as the main military force of the period, right? It, it was the case already from the early Middle Ages, uh, but until the, essentially the, the, the second half of the 12th, you do have infantry victories, meaning infantry alone, right, without combined arms still being able to to thwart a, uh, a cavalry charge, right? You would have to, 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 away and, uh, to win, right, the day. Um, so multiple cavalry charges telling the truth. Um, the, uh, the 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 result will be denied by cavalry until the early 14th century. So not much of a huge time of of cavalry complete dominance of the battlefields. Um, that still so uh, an incredibly uh, uh, strong cooperation and con- as as constant uh, one between. The various arms. Yet it's in these centuries that cavalry gains steam uh, and affirms her superiority um, at the fullest of her moral and technical uh, level, right? Um, and armor, say the panoply, um, uh, overall uh, reflects uh, this uh, this in- intensification. Um, for better protection, especially of the entire body, given that not just the knight was more exposed, right? Generally speaking, cavalry is um, is more vulnerable. Let's say we're talking about a temporally, right? Cavalry can do only one thing: that is charging. It doesn't have other function. Cavalry cannot def- defend by definition unless it dismounts and so becomes infantry, which did happen, right? So still. Um, the, the shield at this point was not designed exclusively for mounted combat and you have to, to, to look at it uh, in that way um, but uh, it, um, it has to and so it, the guy is especially during the 11th to 12th century can also find himself uh, a lot right cut out um, taking on much larger amount of enemies than, than his right giving proof of this incredibly and traumatically violent peak of individual professionalism, right, together with what, however, forms gradually as an ever more compact collective training, um, which entails, in the latter case, this incredibly smashing uh, charges, right? People say, but, you know, cavalry, you know, didn't really charge into infantry or, or other cavalry. You know, they, they normally, like, it never happened, they changed uh, direction at last bit. Yeah, you know, these people smash, we, we know it pretty well, right, from not just battle accounts, but also throughout all the entire history of cavalry, that the point there, the major force is smashing into each other, which means that, given you know, that they charge at canter, that is 45 kilometers per hour, you're, say, in, in, in the best um, of situation, charging infantry, and so smashing at that same speed. If you charge against cavalry is charging at you, you hit somebody at 90 kilometers per hour. Now, you, you already know, uh, as a motorcycler, if you had that experience, what it means to go at even just, you know, falling or, you know, having thinking to have an accident at 20 kilometers per hour, 30 kilometers per hour, you smash yourself. The human body is not designed biologically to, to, to say, survive without damage 
um, at uh, you know a few you know kilometers per hour. So you have some of the most unspeakable, uh, you know, and, and, and terrifying experiences in that regard. And yes, it is true that the impact of, of, of cavalry was uh, much greater from a moral point of view, as all warfare really is. It's not about this traumatically disintegrating. Uh, physical impact. It, it's about the moral force that you need to have in order to be able to carry that out orderly, aligned, etc. That's what these people really spent their entire life on horseback for uh, until they were in their, you know, 80s. And so we have examples of, of this in this sense of still old people participating, old knights participating to, to tournaments at that age and so on. But especially, you know, with Sandy, a cavalry charge is one of the single most um, you know, irreversibly traumatic experience that a person can even dream to think to to get into, right? We know that even from a reenactment with no actual charge meant in the first place, um, that you know even professional military doesn't actually uh, stand in line orderly if charged with with cavalry um, uh, for like a fake. Right, so that is the level of people that are able to take on tanks, uh, which you know, other stuff. So that is the level of impact, and these people were so morally loaded to be able to do this, but also to resist, like for an entire day under cavalry charges. Right, so as you understand, everything here in, uh, in the equipment is molded in a way that is perfectly functional to this. You can see it in the helmets, in in the in the lances, etc. Um, in any case, the, the shield at this point uh, stretches um, pointed downwards, right? Uh, the upper part maintains its round shape because it had still the function of deflecting the cuts that, you know, in order to be successful, had to arrive at practically like 90 degrees compared to the to the punct to form, you know, uh, in fact, uh, uh, part of the uh, surface of the curved surface of of, of the shield. Uh, uh, edge, uh, which definitely is quite complicated. Uh, but again, there were lots of ways uh, you could get injured in, or in destroying even a shield in the first place. Um, and there is another fact to to observe that aside from the fact that armor, as a consequence, increases because the impacts are much, the forces involved are much greater than ever before on a regular basis. And even think about I don't know crossbows, etc. The shield does begin, as we will see now, to shrink. And uh, there is a factor in this that is the higher the collective training, objectively the, the least important the shield really was. Right Throughout all the Middle Ages, of course, the men-at-arms was engaged in those uh, also individualistic feats right, of, of warfare. The men-at-arms were the stormtroopers right, uh, of, for example, of fortresses. So they had to necessarily in, in individually storm the fortifications, say, climbing ladders and so on. So, um, admittedly, there were different types of shields that could be used um, at a given time. You didn't come out just with this shield forever, right? There were different types, and we'll talk about them um, now. They were diversifying. Uh, in any case, and evidently, also the the drop shield one, ha uh, shaped one, had been functional to those endeavors. But they were also pretty long, um, and uh, so they could take the it was always a compromise between agility and protection um, uh, that you have to choose, right? But if your main point, at least your your elected function, which is not necessarily the one you're going to be more often into, so consider always that, is charging in a very thickly packed formation with that um, crystalline order, hopefully, to functionalize the, of course, the collective effort. Um, of a smashing cavalry charge, well, the shield was, let's say, one of the least functional elements in there, because a melee would, would answer to some degree, you would have to, to parry yourself uh, from blows and so on, but uh, it was about this collective functionalization, which up to the previous centuries had been, of course, less in, in scale, uh, and so affecting the panoply accordingly. Uh, the development in length uh, had been favoring, as we said, the rider's legs, as well as that of the torso. 
to to a degree, at least the the side, because that enveloping um, that uh, uh, shape had, as we explained, that specific function. Um, it was used, as we will see it, both on foot and horseback. Uh, in in both cases, it provides good protection of the vital parts of the of the body. Um, now. Unfortunately, from an archaeological point of view, no example of almond-shaped shield has come down to us. You would think, how? It was so easy. Yeah, but we know that from iconography, right? It's normal not to have until the, the late 13th, the early 14th century archaeological evidence of organic uh, material. You can have the, the bosses, the stuff, but the, the wood, uh, of course, also the leather is gone. Right, and we do not really have, uh, unless we are extremely lucky, but not in this case, unfortunately, um, an actual example or something that this gives us a concrete idea of how it was uh, built overall in, say, in practice. Right, in line of principle, we can reconstruct that, but say we would also like to see um, what. What was the material side of the story? Because the the iconographic aspect is often very accurate, and probably even in the exceptions, in what seems like even extravagant, um, it, it it does probably reflect things that were used used use for real, right? But uh, material culture does tell us something different, usually, from say the the representations that can be a bit more um, artistically uh, licensed. Um, so, uh, the, the, there are doubts uh, and interpretations due to the inaccuracies and simplification of the authors that legitimately didn't care to describe a shield. Because, again, first of all, how it, it's just a piece of wood, right? There is not like a, a great principle behind that. Um, I don't know, w would you like to explain to a person what, what a, different card types look like today? Right, if we didn't uh, pass down other traces, you cannot use this to complain about narrative sources that actually focus on the most important things, the moral dimension, the political one. That's what matters in, in war, right? Not the shape of shields. I mean, who cares? Admittedly, like um, in the oldest illustrations, uh, it is observed that the kite-shaped shield could be both concave and flat. Right, this this was the norm of you know the the range of what you wanted to have. But right? you could interlock those shields, even in the flat case, and the concave one was surely preferred by those who wanted to to be a bit more adventurous out there. Um, and uh, but also this is a generalization because you could find yourself with either of the two and still going with that, but conceptually. So uh, we also know that. Um, it, it was the shield was well equipped, uh, at least in some specimens, with a metal reinforcement on the edge. Also in this case, it also had a boss, although it was probably no longer used to strike the enemy, at least as before. And it had still that defensive, uh, you know, function. The grip also had changed. Um, that 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 is the most important aspect of uh, in relation with the boss. No longer a handle. As in the case of the round shield, but a, but a forearm. And the best known representation of this type of shield is, of course, uh, that of the Bayeux tapestry, which celebrates the deeds of the Norman William the Conqueror and his victory over the Anglo Saxons in the famous Battle of Hastings of 1066. The shields illustrated in this masterwork are held in different ways. On the back, they have a series of leather straps, the anarme riveted inside the shield, which each warrior probably had the craftsman arranged in the way he deemed most comfortable. Another very important aspect, uh, the, the panoply was normally, was in part produced, of course, in in series, in, with some degree of standardization, but especially for the knights, we could afford the best and uh, literally, you know, uh, uh, had serves that work for them for that purpose that they could instruct um, uh, and, and commit about and commit this this uh, this equipment 
everything was hopefully adjusted anthropometrically right uh to the warrior's uh uh size uh, this is especially true for swords etc but shields too right everything had to be ergonomic functional anatomically and etc and the probably the fittings here are important because you want it to go out there very compact without anything let's say leaving dangerous openings yet at the same time being wielded with ease right for properly i don't know your limbs like and then your your muscular capacity and uh, that you had to also to grow into it uh, bear it in mind you know that uh, they started being trained as as knights as as kids and so uh, we do know that there were there were equipment armament for for children uh, children sized or kids sized I mean, uh, um, both infantrymen um, and knights hold the shields uh, in the left hand this was normally the case even for uh, the the left-handed themselves, uh, say uniformity could, could change. You could have different, uh, you could switch. Um, but generally speaking, even as a right-handed person, we learn how to fight as as a uh, as a left-handed person as a right-handed one. Uh, you do learn. It's not that complicated at the end of the day, and it's a matter of lots, lots, a lot of practice that really designs your brain, in, in, even in different ways. Um, it was before in adding more, uh, in progress, in training. So it's very difficult um, to reconstruct that too, right? Uh, we do not know what these lives were like, right? In directly, right? Um, what these people believed or how they thought, right? The most difficult thing when I teach history is to illustrate the degree by which people were really different mentally from us, right? Which is also not like a, a complete separation from us, but say highlighting how mostly we're slobs um, nowadays uh, by, by all means, right? In comparison, that we have enormous potential that these people were forced but also they would learn how to love, how to develop uh, for a life, uh, to, to for a lifetime, uh, and that can bring you very far. And that's how they they believed. Uh, in fact, transfiguration would, would happen. Coming closer to the truth, the capacity to control, that could make you uh, experience a transcendental status. That one closer to God. If you look at I don't know the designs on on the Bayeux tapestry and on others, you find the the Griffin, for example. Um, as a common animal, it is in between, like the Apollonian and the uh, uh, the, the Dionysian, right? The Uranian and the uh, the Chthonic, right? And it, it, that highlights exactly the balance in which mankind is, right? Between God and nothingness, right? That the mere say, why do they appear so much in sources like Bayeux tapestry or and because they embodied the warrior. It, they were a metaphor for that status and that process of transfiguration would occur um, uh, during during combat specifically, because there was the peak of a moment in which you had to test whether you could handle those forces morally and physically alike, and so bury anything that could happen to you, because if if you had a higher capacity in everything, and that was more likely to happen. And succeeding made a real difference in the world. Um, so uh, things change, as we said, especially towards the 13th century. You have this triangularly shaped uh, shield that derived essentially from the uh, uh, the, the shrinking, let's say, of, of the lower part that now was covered by leg armor. Uh, was increasing, etc., and that um, maintained uh, the the triangular and not the circular shape, uh, also in a pretty cornered way, mostly to defend the flank of the knight. It was usually ever more uh, on horseback, at least the, the heavier, the more functionalized for a an incredible physical. Uh, uh, exertion, right, both on horseback and when you had to storm fortifications, for which the shield was also becoming obsolete on the longer run, uh, given the, the progress in armor. Uh, 
Now the most common handle consisted of a wider strap which the warrior kept around his neck. Uh, we've seen it in, in the previous models. This this was this being the case, right? Um, and a second strap placed in the upper part of the shield design, uh, was designed to be held by the hand. Uh, the pointed lower end alla had allowed the foot soldiers to fix the shield into the ground to form a rudimentary wall sometimes. Um, this is not really um, say a, a thing in a, except in the fact that the shield was heavy, right? And so the at least at some point you wanted to fix it on the ground. This was the case. Well, the Roman scutum was like eight kilos. Have you ever kept like always in your hand uh, a luggage of eight kilos? Uh, it's extenuating. We see also a bit more elaborate uh, designs uh, that come into for the dynastization of noble houses, uh, birds, dragons, geometric lines, St. Andrews, crosses, waves. It all already existed before, but they start becoming more complicated. Um, the, the boss, interestingly enough, was uh, integrated into the decoration and painted accordingly, so that everything was actually um, painted, right? Even armor and helmets. They shone like they looked like. Uh, modern motorcycle helmets, all colored, shiny, etc. Um, and this type again of say, style, this type of uniformation, the uh, shield designs, etc. Um, can be observed all across uh, the Frankish, say, the broader Frankish world. Uh, from Poland to Spain, from Scandinavia to Italy, you have all the same type of equipment. Um, you have uh, essentially the, the older almond-shaped shield used during the first three crusades, at least until the 13th century. It continued to be the most popular model without ever changing size, by the way, uh, shape and construction materials. It's because warfare didn't change clamorously in itself, right? It had always been, we tend to, um, of course, we appreciate the acceleration of certain uh, dynamics, but we also tend to underestimate how much exist it existed before and how much you know it continued also later of that type of warfare. Uh, round shields like those that had characterized the first Carolingians did not disappear completely, by the way. Some of them also appear on the uh, Bayeux tapestry together with a square one, all held by the Anglo Saxon, the Anglo Danish infantry. And later, by convention, the illustrators will attribute such round or uh, square shapes to the, to the bad guys, right? Contemporaries like the Saracens, um, or say historical figures like the the Romans who martyred the Christians, right? The idea is that, of course, they they saw in the East, especially the uh, the Saracens, uh, using uh, the 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 Muslims did use the the kind shaped shield. Too, but to a lesser degree, um, and the the round shields because of the greater amount of lighter um, infantry compared to the west uh, and cavalry compared to the westerners was um, was producing this uh, this asymmetry. Right. Also, they that was surely some sort of medieval archaeology. Right. Some like all the the burials of the migration era when warriors were still buried in arms. Well, surely were found. At the time, and they, there was a, a general sensation that, uh, say, that round shape was uh, uh, symptomatic of some sort of paganism or non, uh, you know, non-Christianity, something going wrong along the way, right? After all, the same Dante needed to say that, of course, uh, Muhammad was just a schismatic Christian bishop because there was nothing else conceived beyond. Not just Christianity, but what the sole religion that had always existed at the end of the day uh, really was. Um, so the round shield um, was had been the, the most used by peoples who in the early Middle Ages had invaded the Roman Empire. Uh, that at that point, it was also using essentially round shields, uh, but it had still been used by the Anglo-Saxon Huscarls, the Vikings, the Saracens, so all peoples that had been crushed at the end of the day um, by, say, the forces that were at least considered like the, op the opposite to barbarism, 
of some sort. Uh, even the Christian Anglo-Saxons, right, were would have been conceived like from a Norman point of view, something less, um, and so characterized in a bit more of a. Even though they had the, 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 those same drop shields, um, drop shaped shields uh, as well. So this negative connotation of the round shield remained in the traditional iconography, uh, especially in all the, the biblical works, uh, miniatures, etc. You often see right, again the, uh, this uh, touch of easternness uh, attached, like saying these are, are the Orientals. Let, let's represent in, in this way. Let's distinguish them in this way. Um, Goliath would have, would always have like a round shield, uh, not necessarily, or actually depictions of the country, but this was just like a like a cliche, a stereotype. Now, around the last decades of the 12th century, the shield, as we're saying, uh, undergoes a significant transformation. The upper rounded part was lost or reduced, um, assuming a triangular shape and a less enveloping surface. Infantry and cavalry no longer share the same shield. This is yet another important change um, that has to do with the fact that warfare was becoming ever more specialized and collectively so. So that the, the knights would use a smaller version of the shield where the infantry retained the almond uh, the shaped one for longer. Uh, and this almond shape could change also and uh, tendentially it tended to widen, right? Then, um, in, at least as um, for, for the front lines, um, the uh, and, and even when they adopted uh, the infantry adopted the triangular one, it continued to maintain larger dimensions. In fact, uh, suitable for covering most of the body. And, and there are so many different types that it's not easy now to simply um, list them or looking at all the various affiliations. Uh, that you can spot in this, uh, say, in the, the various branches, this shield uh, typologies, right? But uh, if we were to be um, quite uh, simple and somehow superficial, we can say that the triangular shield um, had evolved from the uh, drop shape one, right? Um, there are different branches goes different directions, right? Some targes, for example, have a more asymmetric um, design that's somehow more squared or po in or pointy. There are also round parts of it, but are more geometric, right? The targes, especially the Italian targes, are very symmetrical, right? So like um, uh, hexagons, rhomboids, forms, something like that. Um, from the... Um, Let's say um, the the drop shaped shield. You also have essentially the the, the pavies evolving. The pavies. We will explain now how it emerged because it has an interesting, um, let's say, concept behind that. And it was probably not even designed, but let's say the, defined by the 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 design per se, but how it was made. Right, what kind of projectiles was meant to stop? Probably had to do something more with penetration of pointy stuff rather than slashing blows, right? From, mostly from projectiles, right? Designed for that reason. But you can ideally think like the the concave drop shield opening and widening, and so forming something also more symmetrical, like babies. Um, so there are the um, the kidney shaped uh, symmetrical shields that were famous for example in Spain uh, they had to do something with the the Arab design was adopted also by the the Christian Hinantas uh, as we will see now you have the uh, the bucklers the uh, the rotelle, um other types that aren't simple to just summarize just like that and there can't be even an effective um, scheme that shows you like all the various branches because in many ways uh, these shields were also very uh, customizable, right, uh, over time. Um, uh, the reason, however, for the shrinking, like uh, the drop-shaped shield to the triangular type, is um, uh, armor. We already said it. And we see, um, especially the leg armor, getting stronger. At that point, as we've seen, even from the coast, like that metal is, protects you much better than, than wood. Uh, you have the great helm uh, for head protection, so even a more comprehensive uh, 
um, the fans for for the head that in part had surely motivated the uh, say the, uh, the 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 permanence of that prior design especially for blows that would arrive from below right but seeing uh, earring was very important the great helm stems mostly from the necessity of pairing yourself from a lax in the face during the charge right so very narrow isolates to avoid having your eyes trusted and still um, splinters could be quite nasty in that regard uh, very small holes for for breathing uh, you would all uh, before charge hopefully uh, keep the the helm off right and just putting it on at the last minute sometimes and um, these are all things that depend of course on the circumstance but everything goes uh, accordingly so with the head well protected and the lower extremities more sheltered the shield could become smaller lighter and more manageable and so also less important right uh, once again we have to rely mostly on artistic representations to look for a general rule the great helm does not seem to have known an immediate and uniform spread during due to its high cost this is something that spread from france became also quite distinctive of germany at a point um, but also again it at the end of the day it spreads all over um, and mostly for the heaviest type of cavalry um, and we see instead the triangular shield also used by warriors equipped with a traditional conical helmet at some point or a simple knitted cap which left the face uncovered uh, it is therefore possible that maneuverability and lightness had become the most important and required um, features at least for very specific type of cavalry uh, this is obvious for the for lighter types of design think about the chapelle de fer um, the necessity apparently actually the more risky one of getting closer to the enemy uh, for uh, especially the very heavily armored ones with plate armor now surrounding the the abdomen etc to to stick like a, a dagger into the armpits were some of the least the most vulnerable areas they were not armored at times at least with the uh, with the plate um, and the uh, that uh, that required a, li a lighter equipment paradoxically as we were saying before that aggressiveness that could in this case be employed just however with a combined arms not always and still we're looking at very say unscientific ways of the or undoctrinal ways of of deciding this stuff um, you have to count which troops were available which mostly was a political problem not really uh, also armament was usually a matter of you know who could bring what right not much of how it could be produced in a centralized fashion which also existed especially in in the city states that were more affluent for these things and so on in any case right you see that the triangular shape remains for lighter forms of troops that distinguish themselves from the heaviest ones that that instead need less that kind of sh uh, need less shield in the first place it makes it makes a lot of sense the former are lighter and so they need still more protection the others don't anymore to some degree um, also in the late 12th century you have um, heraldry we said becoming ever more complex um, right you have uh, status um, specific bloodline um, and this sense that um, so the things were getting more complicated from a political and juridical point of view there was a more rigid hierarchy code this corresponded to the lock of nobility properly that was now mostly a matter of careful selection also from from the monarchy uh, the system was not so open with so many different um, knights uh, like before so that paradoxically uh, standardization follows especially for the lesser troops but for these higher ones it becomes ever more complicated right to to pose with all the, the uh, say dynastic inheritances etc with, with all the the possessions that you had it was still a very gradual thing um, but to say that the heraldry becomes more further uh, uh, more elaborated um, the best place and also the most traditional to host such um, 
coat was on the shield, given its large, clearly visible and regular surface. Right, thus, it became the main place to represent it, if not the only uh, one. Right, think about the crest, the surcoat, etc. Et so everything was standardized. Everything came in a in as one. Right, you had to look as a single piece of very harmonized um, capacity. Let's say the peak of this individualistic capacity is the late 13th, the early 14th century, then eventually things start changing a bit, also in the meaning of being a man-at-arms, right? Um, but the custom of hosting heraldic symbols on the, on the shield is still alive today, in institutions, in politics, and so on. So th despite the exaltation of um, its role, the sh in this case, like, the shield was headed towards extinction, definitely. The triangular one remained in use until the 15th century, in different uh, size, right? But the general progress of weapons uh, and armor could only determine its inexorable decline. There were always resurgences, as we will see in the end, of the idea of the shield, even in times of firearms, etc. But, as you know, they wouldn't be particularly successful. Now, the evolution towards ever more complete forms of armor represented definitely a double threat to the use of the shield. On one hand, the plate armor already sufficiently protected the body of the knight. Uh, on the other, the most um, uh, suitable weapons to successfully challenge armor were blunt ones. Uh, it would be interesting to talk about them, because also relatively to, to this war, right, things did change, uh, especially the introduction of plate armor. Uh, and so maces and war hammers that really made the shield uh, complicated to use because essentially would, they, they would uh, strike exactly where you were holding with your hand. It was a very delicate structure, and that would were you know blunt weapons would you know load uh, like a very um, big power there, smash easily your articulations and so on. So especially with such a modest. Um, or organic protection. So plate armor was in fact what uh, those weapons uh, started to be further developed, designed for, um, and there was no room for, for the shield there. I mean, in part, yes, you could still use, you can still use uh, a, a shield to, to protect yourself in desperate uh, straits, but um, this could happen in I don't know, well, for example, uh, an armored opponent was more likely to use blunt weapons that were shorter, right, would get a close hand in, in, into close combat, hand-to-hand -to -hand combat with uh, likely armored troops, right, it was mostly the, the light armor that would keep the enemy at distance with pole arms, um, because if they had come closer, we wouldn't have enough protection. So if you understand how devastating the thing was getting, also missile warfare was uh, increasing in importance. Uh, firearms were starting to be around. So you know, at that point, like, the shield was becoming partially obsolete and or was being uh, uh, extended, as we'll see now, to the degree of pavises or even fixed uh Pavises, meaning like sort of some sort of a siege machine, say structure rather than than a shield, right? Uh, and there is, however, to say that there had always been some kind of difference, uh, let's say the, some kind of uh, gradation in that regard, right? You can never say when a uh, say, for example, a firearm is is a handgun or a, uh, or or a, or an artillery. Uh, to to some point, right in in the in between. Or same goes for shields and some pieces of mobile palisade of some some sort, right? Um, regarding the pavis um, uh, and um, and the targes, by the way, uh, the first pavises witnessed as sort of more like um, square-like uh, shield that for what they became more famous for, telling the truth, uh, are in early 13th century Lithuania. 
Um, and this has to do with the type of targets of, say, squared uh, designs that you find even in certain Balkan, Central, or Eastern European cavalry. In fact, they spread uh, exactly like the Lithuanian pavis um, that had already used those kind of rectangular shaped sheets from a long time uh, with the purpose of pairing themselves from the higher level of missile fire coming from the, the, the steppe nomads. Right, we've seen it in our steps for a uh, series. Um, so that explains why a place like Lithuania, right? Um, the most famous Pavis that is, uh, is the Italian one from which, uh, let's say, the, the generalized Pavis of the late Middle Ages spreads more. And even there, the Pavis um, that despite the etymology has nothing to do with um, with pavia, but rather with pavement, right? That's the Latin etymology. Seems to have, in fact, indicated very different types of shields because at the beginning we don't have an arche archaeological evidence of pavises. We mostly have the ones from the, uh, say, the late 14th, the, the 15th century. But the first ones seem to have been used also by cavalry, the so-called pavisotto. Right from these Italian sources, uh, but extensively also like uh, a normally shaped shield of some sort, um, and the etymology suggests a thicker, uh, like a sounder, because uh, pavement, uh, pavimentum comes from say thickening by say compacting, right by hammering it in the sort of course not the boot uh, to make the pavis, but. but still conceptually, like some multi-layered thing, at least this is the etymology that I give to it, right? Um, and as I was saying at the beginning, like, there is nothing particularly complicated here, right? You can't say that, yes, uh, places like Italy were definitely the most technologically advanced, if not the single most technologically advanced, while Lithuania, for example, wasn't. But the Pavis, for how it develops, it, it's just a freaking shield, right? It doesn't take... Uh, a technological genius or a military engineering culture behind the, the conception. These shields had always existed, just they were um, spread further, enhanced, developed um, because of certain specific purpose. For example, the Italians had a lot of crossbow uh, fire around, so that may be a, a good uh, idea that larger amounts of infantry, for example, that needed uh, this more widespread protection against the, that intense, like you could, you could have tens of thousands of quarrels falling in an hour, right, on, on a battlefield. Um, so this explains uh, the thing in part. Um, and the later shields, we've seen it also in uh, some videos, yeah, about still, we will have to talk about it more in, in detail, that maintain that rectangular shape, which is not necessarily what existed in Italy, for example, at the beginning, nor um, what necessarily existed everywhere, like for pavises, they still somehow man maintain a sort of oval shape, um, a bite oblong, etc., not necessarily being simply a fixed rectangular zetz shield, as the the Germans called it, for example, like as a fixed um, palancade, some sort of wooden, uh, mobile wooden protection to fix on the ground. Um, has to do also with the, the aforementioned, like the later, you see it again in Balkan cavalries mostly, this squared shape that um, was mostly designed to cover the corners because there was more uh, arrow fire going around. And so covering the, the corners, this is some sort of good explanation that fits also with the type of riding in a more crouched position that you find in the Balkans, in places like Hungary or in Eastern Europe, um, that was more typical of the step that they had uh, Hungarian knights, even if they were kind of fully Western by this point, like they still retained at some point the higher stirrup, like the steps people. And so you had this more crouched position that was, was a, probably the only good way if you didn't have enough armor for the lighter cavalry to protect yourself even from from arrow fire, so the plus the rectangular shape that has more, say, surface to uh, oppose to the direction where the arrows arrive, may explain some typical shields you find among the Usars, among the the Croatians at some point, uh, etc. That also in the Renaissance are famous for this kind of form. Also in Poland, through the 
the Hungarian type, like, originally it was a Serbian cavalry, but, as you know, it became first heavy and light, uh, etc., so, in, in the other countries, so it, it's complex, we'll talk about it in another, in another occasion, still you have, of course, branches that remain like they were originally, so that's why it's complicated, but just know that this is the case. Another type of shield, less important, but still useful out there, is the buckler. Um, as we've seen, it's this round metal fist shield, right, uh, widespread in the civil sphere, um, starting from the, the 13th century. Comfortable and relatively small, we're talking about between 20 and 50 centimeters in diameter for about one kilo in weight. It was concave, it could be hung from a belt and used in case of need as an instrument of defense and offense. It's a bit of multitask little thing, right? Um, extraordinary mobility and also pretty resistant, right? Uh, because of the material. Um, it allowed to deflect the opponent's blows and to injure him using it uh, as an iron fist, practically. Uh, there were different varieties, but, uh, for example, in some cases it was equipped with a tip, which increased in the offensive potential, just again, the punch of, of the boss. Um, it could be even be spiked at some point, uh, historically, uh, before these times. And in the Renaissance, sword and buckler combat was codified and taught in fencing schools, becoming a real discipline even, right? But if you look at, say, I don't know, the, the English um, archers of the Hundred Years' War, light infantry, uh, not meant necessarily to engage in hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, but they would, also because swords had become relatively cheap, and even an average commoner could buy some, uh, like in that case. Um, but that was, like, the minimum extra protection uh, that you could even tie to your arm while you were shooting with a longbow, right? Um, and and so acting as a little bit more multifunctional role, especially during skirmishes, right? These troops were sent as scouts, as uh, explorers for reconnaissance, etc. They would meet enemies that were equally light and uh, also aggressive-minded at that level between light infantrymen. Um, and so such smaller shields would turn out to be pretty useful uh, in such circumstance and even on the battlefield as we were saying before there were missiles firing like if a crossbow bolt hit you well you know good luck with that <laughs> you know if you are light uh, lightly armored um, uh, that trooper like in that case but again th the best defense for those troops was the volume of fire and they weren't even the, the most important target Right, they they shot against each other if they were deployed on on the wings, but the main target, say, well, the yeah, it's it's true. They they would also try to take each other out to flank each other. This is particularly true in in Italian warfare, right? But if you look at the Hundred Years' War, um, yes, it did happen. They would shoot at each other, crossbowmen, famously enough, and. Um, a longbow, and uh, were designed to do so for one another, in fact, um, by default, right? But it would also attack the, the flanks of cavalry, right? Uh, if they could, right? Attacking, like, moving on, on their flanks, it, it was not protected, and trying to take them out. Naturally, you had to take out their wings as well, and th I'm, I'm personally researching on this very topic, just so that you know, so that I, I think I'm tearing, saying terribly simplified things just for for the sake of time here but um, it's a bit more complex and also uni uniform right uh, universal on European battlefields that you may think so why don't we look at the sunset of the Middle Ages um, we observe uh, still a lot of continuity and effect effectiveness of the men at arms Right. The main problems on the battlefields for men-at-arms were actually in at the beginning of the, in the first half of the 14th century. Then with the mid-14th century crisis, the plague, etc., you have essentially the Ancien Regime created. So I, it was actually a moment in which the nobility rose even faster, or even over. But since they could, in fact, now control the people better, uh, even the so-called infantry revolution was absolutely not a matter of freeing of the people. On the contrary, it was in fact a process of saying, 
them being able to command these people um, and in, in a sense also defeating them right even if uh, of course dur during the renaissance things would definitely change cavalry enter did enter a severe crisis but it did not disappear either right in any case it was this few people still maintained the power um, just pike and shot uh, tactics took over at that point um, during charges with the spear, the shield continued to fulfill a useful role, despite undergoing some small modification in shape, especially for tournaments shields. The upper right corner was cut to form a recess in which um, supporting the legs, thus ensuring greater stability. Uh, tournaments, as you know, were becoming at this point from a past in which they didn't differ at all from combat, also because people were killed regularly, like in normal engagements, uh, into something much more, um, you know, uh, artificial. And so you see this this ultra emphasis also of the, say the, uh, the, the the development of certain absolutely impractical armor in in actual warfare, right? But that was functional actually to preserve the safety. Of um, and, and increase also the spectacularity of the tournament. Tournaments would go on for until the 18th century, telling the truth. Um, and this is this aspect is overlooked. Um, in any case, as we we're saying before, between the 14th and 15th century, infantry began to impose its dominance on the battlefield. Um, began, right? Not completely like the uh, men at arms again dominated warfare in many areas especially in central and eastern Europe for, for still a very long time because infantry was not that that strong nor it was still however uh, free right not even in, in the west in practice so um, this um, obliged in, in part um, the men at arms to dismount right uh, so um, this increased the greater use of weapons that required the use of both hands, the, the so-called pole arms that uh, were, as we've seen, uh, used also by the other, uh, by, by the commoners to some degree. Uh, talking in that case, uh, at least especially about pikes, halberds and billhooks, while the knights wore hammers and maces. So the shield here didn't have much uh, of a place anymore. Uh, towards the mid-15th century, uh, the shield disappears from the use of cavalry as well. But now they were so protected by excellent armor that it properly was useless, right? There, there was a brief uh, season experienced by the shield in renewed popularity among infantry some point there were two types of shields at this point one very similar to the one used by the Franks right a smaller one entirely metallic held in the left fist called uh, the washer buckler as we've seen with these shields sword wielding infantry specialists closed contact with the pikemen during malaise slipping under the thick forests of pikes that formed in those cases um, think about the Spanish rodeleros but they were good sportsmen that's specialized in, in this um, there were also double hand uh, swords that were used to create these gaps within pikemen but everything was much more say messy than, than we think um, the same men at arms could, could do this in practice but at that point it would mostly um, fight um, mounted right at least in those contexts where they could operate in a more collective fashion and not say getting into that hellish experience that a pike uh, you know uh, uh, pike combat uh, really was right so the expedient of um, swordsmen against pikemen was was not widespread together with shields as well because it, it required a, first of all a good number of specialists that were expensive to train whereas um, the pikemen had to be many, but could be um, uh, more effective as a broader uh, mass, right? The, the pike uh, fencing was extremely simple, say primitive. It, it, it just required a great effort you know, of collective training, etc. But it was about concentrating this mass in, in a way so that 
um, the pikemen learn to defend themselves. They shorten, for example, their grip on the weapon, right, to uh, to be more effective against these uh, swordsmen. And in a second large and heavy type, the palbies that we were talking about before was uh, used in some cases, at least as a sort of um, parapet, mobile parapet used by ranged troops, crossbowmen, um, and even early firearms marksmen. Uh, in that uh, occasion, you would understand the point. They, you, especially during siege warfare, um, they could approach an enemy, enemy fortification well repaired, but it's larger shields and or uh, shooting from the, behind them or having them, uh, let's say, slung over their back. Right. Well, if they crouch, turned while uh, while uh, reloading, for example, things like that. Uh, and it was precisely the introduction of firearms that marked the end of the shield, making it disappear from the battlefield, because simply the the jowls that you know were carried by a, a bullet were basically out uh, performing any other type of um, uh, the, uh, any other type of projectile, and uh, the shield at that point it was not just about the shield, it was about armor. As you've seen, the shield had always been auxiliary to a much more protective armor. And at that point, even armor was practically useless, or at least uh, there could have, there, there was even the possibility of having bulletproof armor, but it was so costly at that point, it was better to invest in firepower. So shooting back, as we were observing at the beginning, you can have smaller shields even if you engage into against a lot of missile fire, because if your missile fire is stronger, that will be your shield, right? Um, so the shield remains, uh, like the, it would have been completely smashed, there are some there are some metal shields that were invented, say, reproposed, say, during the mid-16th century or times like that, even during the Thirty Years' War, there were some metal shields around, right? Um, it's not fantasy, it's just that they weren't widespread, and um, generally speaking, they were uh, say just probably were not worth it. They were still again firearms were not dramatically performing, but still, right? Um, it was better like, at the parity of costs to invest in them than in such defenses. Uh, very heavily armored troops existed until the mid 17th century, and that uh, was mostly at that point anti-firearm technology. Shields really didn't stand much uh, a chance in, in the broader concept, right? So, um, uh, of course, cuirassiers, armor still exists today, etc. But, um, and even, say, generally speaking, the shield, is, you find it in, in close, think about the police, uh, some certain special forces equipment contemplates that for, however, very specific context that's of course, in in open field, for example, doesn't have much of a sense. Uh, the shield remained in use essentially only in the east. That point, it remained a bit more medieval, had less spike and shot um, around. The same is true from some backward nations in, uh, of Europe, mostly in Eastern Europe, in the Balkans, etc. You have the shield remaining a, a functional weapon also because even there again there were some types of warriors including the steps once roaming around that um, still would use it until the 19th century um, so there would be uh, at the end of the 19th century even some uh, new vogue right of ballistic shields uh, and just think again about the anti-riot one that we were uh, we would still use um, in any case, uh, the shield really becomes increasingly rare from the Middle Ages. It disappears, at least on the Western battlefields during the Renaissance, as a um, say numerically relevant uh, element. Right? There, are some, there is some nostalgia, definitely. I mean, uh, during the English Civil War, there were still people going around with longbows uh, and Needless to say, that was the the last time. At least, even during World War II, you could see some someone 
famously now for doing so, but not in a systemic sense. Um, and we will talk about that more because don't underestimate still the the power the effectiveness of these weapons in general um, the shield I was just referring to the long bows here and but thinking about Britain also the Scots for example used some more primitive weaponry and the Scottish Highlanders during the Jacobite rising of 1745 uh, notoriously used their a circular uh, small shield, right? Uh, a Perth craftsman, William Lindsay, produced hundreds in, t in two models. The officer's one, which cost 10 shillings, and the private's one, which was worth only five. And, and it was known as the targe at that point. It could also be equipped with a tip up to 30 centimeters long, so surely some, some red coat was killed. Um, uh, even with, with those tips, but as we know, you know, it didn't end well for the Highlanders, uh, to say the least. Now, the last troops to clash with warriors equipped with shields in Europe were those of Napoleon. It may seem strange, but during the invasion of Russia in, 12, uh, in 1812, both the Cossacks and the nomadic Asian cavalry enlisted in the army of the Tsar um, uh, were equipped uh, often, at least with shields, right? Where they remained a bit more, you know, archaically connected to uh, to archery, to speed, etc. In in those vast Eastern European plains, again, you that that warfare was somehow functional still. Um, but uh, they also used firearms, uh, and so mm, the shield specifically was only a sort of symbolic presence right um, so this is it like we could think of many other aspects of shields and how and why they were used and let's say when I when I make this video as, as I observed at the beginning it's always a sort of general uh, you know introduction because we get uh, into much more detailed stuff as you know in other chapters but I think it's important also to get to the basics because it can help to conceptualize certain things I, I increasingly get people telling me like oh, I prefer the more general videos even about say literally medieval history manuals and especially the cheap ones <laughs> you know not even the say, more serious advanced say more serious manuals um, because I realized that, unfortunately, history is not taught, of course, uh, intelligently. But that especially, you know, when you go too much in depth, uh, if that's, generally speaking, the, the average level, uh, you understand people don't even get the references of what you say. I also like to be provocative sometimes uh, by saying things that challenge people's opinions sound uh, somehow... Uh, even uh, unpleasant but it's part of the game because there are some essentials and I think it's typical of um, say contemporary degeneration to get into to dissect details but without background right and since I have some background at least I think that it could be well spent uh, by yes I have fun with the more detailed stuff, but also with this broader concept, which indeed do pose a challenge per se, because they they definitely oblige you to be to the point to get the thing uh, down to the uh, like without escapes, like without shortcuts, right, uh, and to the very basics. So this, I think, is much more useful than other videos, at least uh, it, it, it's a combined arms style uh, of, of operation, right? You, if you have both, uh, you get much more powerful than the sum of the single types. Um, for today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like. 
or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.